Excellent. Thank you yes. very much. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can I? Yeah, OK. So I'm going to give you like 15 minutes overview on um, how some of the civil developments that we're doing um, are, being, are starting to be used or being developed with a view to being used uh, by the wider security community. Um, if we just start with some context, maybe 30 years ago, security was a much simpler idea, okay? I mean, we had a number of threats. We had justice and rule of law. We had our physical security against bad guys, and we had territorial security. And most of that was taken care of by government institutions, uh, maybe some impacted on citizens, some impacted on industry, but it's mainly, it was mainly an institutional uh, element. And this has been sort of alluded to by uh, some of the ideas of... Uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the involvement in the space sector as well. As we've gone through, more uh, security concepts have become uh, evident. So we have environmental security, infra uh, critical infrastructure security, food security has been mentioned, uh, cyber security is an increasing issue, energy security uh, becoming in increasingly pr prominent, with more and more impact away from the public sector uh, stakeholders and onto industry and the citizen, and we're getting into things, also things like uh, societal stability. Uh, now, I mean, from some perspectives, there's a bit of a race which fails first: the Earth system or societal systems, and how do we monitor uh, tipping points in each? So, there's a, a very wide uh, consideration now of security, and that opens up space for a range of different actors, in particular industrial actors, to get involved. Okay, I mean, we, we had the discussion before uh, with the panelists on the nature of innovation on the commercial sector is accelerating faster than in the uh, traditional defense sector. Uh, and again, I mean, that's, uh, that, that combined with this idea of the expansion of security really opens up a number of opportunities. Similarly, I mean, if you think of these dimensions, there's a number of threats. What are we trying to do against these threats with organized crime, weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass disruption is a threat that didn't exist uh, 20 years ago. Now we've got concepts like GPS jammers that can cause enough of an impact that it is a, a, it is a mass uh, consideration, economic equality, economic shocks, financial collapse, but a lot of these things are uh, increasing, have a security dimension. Pandemics and expanding endemics as well are the, one of the more recent uh, ideas to uh, uh, hit the fore. Uh, these are multiplied by things like climate change, political cultural change, economic change. So this generates a sort of situation where we've got climate change leading to loss of resources, leading to the onset of fragility and violence that's fuels, fueling uh, recruitment by terrorism organizations, it's supporting environmental crime, amplified by org organized crime, all of these elements are in there. We've got a whole mix of threats in there. Some of them are dealt with by the traditional defense set, some of them are addressed by law enforcement, some of them are addressed by NGOs. How do all these guys all work together uh, to address and disrupt these things? The other consideration I'd have as a starting point is um, the sort of spectrum of how um, the, the sort of the level of violence and what's involved in a particular uh, security issue. On one end, we've got a free society. Okay, when we're at risk from things like natural disasters, uh, some risk of violent acts. There are criminal actors, etc. But there's not really a systematic deployment of military assets to address uh, what are essentially uh, societal issues. On the other end, we've got full state-on-state -state aggression with full deployment of military assets and really you know, bad stuff. And in between, we've got different levels of, viol of, of aggression and, and, and violence, depending on the extent of the... And it, it's sort of state against non-state actors, um, with an increasing level of deployment of military assets, uh, an increasing uh, threat to these assets, etc. cetera. Um, to, to, to try and put some structure on uh, what I'm going to show you, I've said, well, up to about halfway through that yellow uh, area, Civilian assets for uh, things like data collection, analysis, uh, countering uh, uh, what's, what's going on are probably the most effective, the cost effective solution for this. I mean, civilian assets are an awful lot cheaper to, to deploy and operate than full military assets. They're not designed to, to operate in hard environments. There's, they're not um, uh, robust against countermeasures. They're, they're, they're the, sort of the, the, the cheapest end. They can operate uh, quite happily and, and operate fit for purpose. Um, uh, in, in these sorts of uh, areas. At the other end, uh, where we're in full aggression uh, state on state, there's a lot less space for civilian uh, or commercial systems to be used in a, in a, in, in, in within this level of aggression. Where civilian commercial systems are not designed to be hardened against countermeasures. Uh, they can be, uh, their operation, operational capabilities can be actively denied. 
Uh, there's not really an operational cost constraint either in a lot of situations, so the idea of using commercial against full military stuff is probably not uppermost in everybody's mind. And in this middle space, I think we're looking at sort of activity-based intelligence ideas for, uh, and there is uh, a lot of um, civil to military exchange going from the civil side to the military side. So the, the, the civilian systems, the commercial systems can be multipliers to what's already available for the, for the military elements, that we can have more revisit, we can have more persistence, we can have uh, a wider range of uh, information channels coming in. We've been looking at, also looking at things like um, uh, social media, et cetera, open source intelligence. So a lot of these, um, this, this middle area is probably what's opened up as a result of the evolution of security and the evolution of the commercial sector. Uh, at ESAL, we've been um, uh, developing, uh, supporting development of these, these sorts of capabilities probably for about the last 20 years, looking at things like uh, uh, capabilities such as maritime uh, security, border security, support um, uh, onset of violence, onset of fragility, etc., in developing countries, looking at systematic ways that civilian systems can be used to characterize that. Uh, we've also been cooperating with NATO in the past. For things, there's a program called Rapid, in, uh, Rapid Environment Assessment to support things like uh, uh, sensor operations characterization and command and control systems driven by environmental information and getting the environmental information into uh, NATO decision support systems was uh, uh, an interesting problem and we're looking at how earth observation could fit that. And then there's a sort of a, a gray area for law enforcement where in some cases military assets are used, in some cases there can be military uh, information systems can be used, but uh, you know, I mean these are areas like crimes against humanity, terrorism and organized crime, counterproliferation, etc. Um, so th these are areas that are opening up. We've been doing. I'll show you some examples how the civilian systems can be used in this. Uh, there's also, as was mentioned before, a rapid development in civilian capability. So we're looking at uh, um, constellation type ideas where we've got improved revisit and persistence, uh, new information layers like satellite video, hyperspectral, new uh, radar, uh, like long wavelength radar, so we can get canopy penetration, or we can detect targets under forest. And also the emergence of AI. I mean, AI is uh, uh, well, still in R&D uh, uh, domain, but the, uh, the capability of AI is really, uh, again, a multiplier for the, for the utilization, diffusion, and integration of uh, earth observation data by itself, and also heterogeneous uh, data, earth observation, um, social media, uh, transponder data, etc. We cooperate with a wide range of organizations. This is some of them. Um, and yeah, just from just p uh, for, the, for, for the examples I'm going to show, please remember, we're an R&D agency, we're a civilian agency, so all of these activities have been done in a civilian context with an R&D project. We just happen to do them in uh, real situations, but we're demonstrating fitness for purpose. We don't provide operational services to do this. We demonstrate and or we develop and demonstrate them and then they get handed over to uh, other organizations. This was the first uh, elements that we did. We developed the Copernicus security or the, the precursors for the Copernicus security services in the sort of mid to late uh, 2000s. So we, uh, starting with the Copernicus border security service with Frontex, the uh, support to external action service and the uh, Copernicus maritime surveillance service. These are now fully operational capabilities supporting a wide range of stakeholders, uh, both inside Europe and outside. Um, we also did a whole bunch of uh, projects supporting that. So there's, I mean, uh, we've done uh, previous projects looking at, uh, for example, maritime surveillance. This was a, a, an example uh, that we were involved in. This was a, 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 a Russian-owned Maltese flagged vessel called the Arctic Sea that disappeared uh, going out of the English Channel, and nobody knew where it was. Uh, we were asked to task all of the satellites that we could to try and find where this vessel was. Uh, and we found it, like, within 24 hours of being asked, we, we had data and we found it off uh, Gran Canaria. I'm uh, no, sorry, off uh, Capo Verde. Uh, it was supposed to be going to Algiers, so there was clearly something odd there. Uh, by the time we had the second image, there was uh, two Russian Navy ships either side of, of the vessel. That's what you can see in the top image there. Uh, using satellite surveillance for uh, small vessel tracking over the Atlantic, we've been supporting uh, an organization called MAOC that's um, it's responsible for intelligence sharing and cooperation of intervention operations against drug, uh, mainly cocaine trafficking across the Atlantic. So we were supporting them with the surveillance. That's now transferred into an operational uh, uh, system operated by EMSA and MAOC together. We've been looking at uh, developing uh, capabilities mainly in support of the International Criminal Court, but also in term in, uh, for some uh, uh, national uh, investigative bodies as well for war crimes investigations. So the, the top is uh, uh, changes associated with uh, crimes against humanity in uh, Myanmar. This bottom image is a declassified American uh, military image, uh, which uh, in Rwanda, this is the first satellite image that we know of 
that was used in a legal case. And they, de they declassified the, the data specially for us to do the investigation. The idea was that people in the hotel at the top of where these red arrows are would have known about the roadblocks, which are all these logs that the red arrows are on the road, which was part of the, um, the, the, the massacre. And these people were fighting being extradited to be, um, uh, to be charged. And this was, part of the, this was part of the prosecution saying, look, you must have known what was going on. It's clearly obvious from the satellite image that you can see stuff that's going on. Other things we've been doing are things like counter proliferation. Um, we, work, we worked with uh, organizations such as Airbus and IAEA to build up IAEA's capability to, to be able to utilize not just optical data, they're probably the best people in the world to analyze optical data. We're building up their capability to uh, also integrate uh, satellite imagery into their uh, analysis processes to support the, uh, uh, the uh, safeguards teams when they're investigating uh, the the, the, uh, the uh, things like the, uh, the nuclear power stations that they have to go and inspect, and other areas we've been looking at are things like uh, um, um, environmental crime as well. So this is uh, illegal like, uh, uh, illegal mining of uh, I can't remember. I think it's gold mining, illegal gold mining outside of the license area. Uh, this is the the, the three uh, mining activities. So that's pretty simple, straightforward. Other security domains, so uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work in particular in Southeast Asia on removal of uh, UXO uh, and uh, things like Agent Orange, uh, Agent Orange and other defoliants. Uh, we've been uh, developing systems for doing uh, prediction based on environmental conditions of the propagation of disease. This was for uh, West Nile virus in, in Italy. Uh, we're also looking at uh, uh, trying to understand the characteristics of the um, of the reservoir for Ebola in, in, uh, in West Africa and also supporting things like um, or, uh, justice and rule of law, looking at uh, where voting stations are, are located compared to where populations are, are located. So we can see, is the voting structure going to likely to be fair and inclusive? And also it gives us a special dimension for uh, looking at the voting statistics to see if there's been uh, manipulation of the, of the statistics as well. Uh, just, a, just very quickly, I'm going to speed up a bit. Um, we're also looking at, basically we sort of stumbled over this, but because Earth Observation can do a lot of different things all at once, it, 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 we're, we're, we're saying we're not using it in, in the, uh, the way that we can derive as much value as, we c as is possible. So, for example, for, this was from an activity we did with Interpol on um, rosewood logging or illegal rosewood logging and trafficking out of Madagascar. So we can detect uh, the deforestation. Uh, once we detect the deforestation, the logs have to be moved to quiet ports uh, in the north of Madagascar. Obviously, there isn't a vessel there ready and waiting. It's a bit obvious. Um, so they have to store the logs uh, close to the port. We can, we can detect that. And we can detect vessels loitering with the, all their transponders off uh, that, that, that you know, we, we would then expect them to be, to be in the port. So we can put these three things together as part of an overall intelligence model. It's not we have an intelligence model and then we task the satellite. The satellites are uh, increasingly part of uh, the intelligence model. Right, so uh, what are we doing? We're looking at, uh, from now on, we're looking at three main line, lines of activity, new capability developments, how we embed uh, the EO into operational frameworks, and this sort of new paradigm I was just talking about, how do we foster the development of that. Quickly, some of the new capabilities. So this is, uh, uh, this, this on, on, the, uh, on, on the, on the left-hand side, this is video SAR. Uh, it's, it's very short uh, time duration vi uh, video, but we can still see a lot of movement. It's much more interesting than just the static. And we can do the same. This is uh, video from a Slovenian satellite called Nemo HD. You can see airplanes moving around. Uh, on their sea down at the bottom there. Uh, we, get it, we can get up to about seven or eight minutes of video. And the other thing they do is leave the video on when they're uh, flying around. That makes you sick after a bit, but uh, it's an interesting capability. Hyperspectral is giving us a lot of, a lot of new uh, elements for the security sector, like detection of camouflage that wasn't possible before. Uh, increasing capabilities also in different uh, wave bands for RF signal detection, so in particular for things like maritime security. If a vessel goes dark, we can still detect the radar. Uh, we can detect other things like uh, uh, mobile phone, satellite phone, etc. On optical data, we're looking at things like parallax, also things like, this is meteorological data in the middle, and you can see there's a white dot there that uh, lights up. That's the uh, US Tomahawk attack on the Syrian uh, airbase a few years ago, so we're able to detect that in very low resolution imagery. We're developing systems for low light level feature detection so that when we've got constellations of optical data outside of the nice time frame for uh, acquiring opt optical data, like half past 10 in the morning, if we're looking at acquisitions close to dawn or dusk, we're still able to enhance uh, systematically the capabilities in the, uh, of, of what we can detect in the imagery. Other ways of, of looking at this are also things that we're doing a lot of work on super resolution feature enhancement for optical, uh, sphere, and uh, long wavelength thermal infrared. 
On SAR processing, in the middle there, we, we, uh, we're systematically detecting uh, anti-aircraft uh, surveillance uh, radar systems, and Bellingcat have made an open source software available. Um, if you want to uh, take Sentinel-1 data and look for anti-aircraft systems, they've, they've made an open source software available for you to, uh, you, you just put the Sentinel data into that and uh, uh, off you go. Uh, we're looking at other techniques as well, like uh, inverse SAR processing, sorry, I'm out of time, so we use the, the, the um, we, we use the, the movement of targets of interest inside the integration time of the radar to improve the resolution so we can see that what is really blurry is actually a tanker. And this is something I was mentioning earlier uh, on the right-hand side here. This is, uh, we can detect the vibrations uh, on the structure of the ship so we can understand the structure of the ship and we can also uh, un understand what its uh, sonar signal would be. Okay, a lot of AI-based uh, activities, new space constellations are giving you uh, increase uh, a massive increase in persistence, revisit, etc. So it becomes possible to really characterize processes, not just uh, look at situation awareness. So that, that gives us a way of identifying uh, onset of crisis as well as understand what the impact of the crisis should be. We're supporting this with a whole bunch of IT uh, or capability development, so things like cloud-based scalable processing, so we've got much faster access, uh, processing of imagery, uh, as well as other, other new technologies. I mean, we've got such a large volume of data, we really have to start looking at uh, up to like very fast uh, database uh, technologies as well for AI systems to uh, be able to do what we're expecting and really rapidly extract uh, features of interest, rapidly make correlations, etc. That needs an optimization of the, of the uh, database structures and yeah, the use of new processing approaches like GPU structures, etc. Uh, okay, that's just some examples that are going on just now. Um, right, this is this is what I want to get to. This is the sort. Of, this is the most recent activity uh, we're looking at. So, somebody, there was a pr presentation earlier talking about the uh, the communication of the optical fiber between Svalbard and uh, and mainland Europe. Uh, so, there is a threat to uh, the, the, this sort of infrastructure. So, what? We're, doing, we're just starting a, 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 an experiment now in, in Ireland. Uh, they've given us an, optical fi an underwater optical fiber uh, to play with. Um, so if a vessel gets close to that cable, uh, like say, it, it will be uh, uh, transmitting signals. So we, I mean, that can be the AIS transponder. We can detect the RF emissions. Uh, also, uh, with the satellite imagery, again, we can uh, just with normal backscatter, we can see that we can see the vessel, and from the technique I was talking about, we can see the vibrations which are related to their sonar signature. By sending a pulse through the cable in a particular way, um, that pulse is very sensitive to any small perturbation to the cable, uh, and we can actually, it actually works like a sonar sensor. So we can see basically when a vessel is coming close to the, the cable, we can pick up its sonar uh, signal, and we can relate that to the micro Doppler signal. So we can, we've basically got an, uh, an integrated surveillance system that is uh, a, hopefully a fairly effective uh, threat capability. We, we've related the micro Doppler to the sonar already, and we're, we're trying to do this last step, and we're doing that uh, hopefully this summer, okay, into this integrated surveillance. So that's uh, a space-based uh, capability uh, hopefully that's addressing the sort of emerging threat that everybody's uh, increasingly worried about. Uh, it's a sort of hybrid threat as well, so it's, it's more sensible, it's more, if we can do it with civilian systems without the cost and complexity of military systems, let's try and do it with civilian systems where we can. It's much more cost effective and it's shareable, okay? It's, it's not classified, it's shareable between all of the different actors that are involved. Uh, okay, that, this was just the, um, uh, the new paradigm I was uh, suggesting as well. Basically, we've got so much data uh, around that rather than just doing situation awareness, we can start understanding the context of underlying processes and really start getting some predictive uh, intelligence. In particular, when we combine this with uh, digital twin uh, uh, predictions and forecasting as well, it means we really th these data can uh, and these analytics can be an integral part of the intelligence picture for uh, the sort of hybrid threats in particular that we're uh, increasingly worried about. Uh, lastly, okay, I mean, these are, these are the, the, the sort of capabilities we're, we're increasingly trying to put together, IoT sensor networks, OSINT uh, type things, um, uh, UAVs and uh, increasingly uh, high altitude pseudo satellites, so the sort of balloons that China was sending over the US, we're, we're developing uh, all of these uh, in, in Europe as well, and uh, increasingly as well the uh, uh, the uh, commercial satellites put together with all the technologies I was talking about, customized databases, analysis-ready data, high-performance processing, et cetera. Uh, hopefully, this gives us a whole integrated civilian, shareable, unclassified uh, analytics and predictive capability. Uh, and that's just some conclusions there. So civilian capabilities have advantages. They can be used uh, for uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, hybrid, uh, quasi-military, uh, but definitely security threats that maybe we wouldn't have been so 
uh, route operational or operationally ready to do something like this in the past. This is increasingly available, increasingly credible. Uh, and yeah, uh, you know, if, it's, if we're not in a full military uh, situation, it's a, it's a more cost-effective and shareable way of, of doing things. Um, in order to make that work, we need partnerships really uh, with, with the right sort of stakeholders, uh, both on the industry side and also between the, uh, the, the institutions involved as well. So go. these are starting to be put in place. We're, you know, they're still, it's still at the exploratory level, but uh, uh, you know, it, it, the, the partnership is really a basis uh, for, for moving these forward. There's a lot of opportunities in there for uh, industry to develop new capabilities to have these things integrated. You have a number of program opportunities to do that, whether that's conventional ESA funding, uh, such as what I'm running, whether it's the RPA program that is your, your sort of protected national money uh, inside, uh, inside ESA, or whether, I mean, there's, there's other opportunities as well. Talk to Caspers, talk to me if you're interested. And sorry for overrunning, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. <laughs>